Why is America becoming a heathen nation? Um, I'm going to do a study today on that, something the Lord's been pressing and putting on my heart. And uh, just thinking about it and just, you know, you go out in public and you just see people and you think, I wouldn't have seen this even 10 years ago. And I live in the, you know, pretty remote area here on our property. And you can see the, a lot of the wild lupine behind me. Um, nice time of the year here. I think today's July 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 6. You want to get a King James Bible, make sure you have one. Paper, if you can have one. And uh, turn in your Bible and read along. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. We're going to be going through these verses, and I'm going to stop and just make some comments and tie it in with what's going on. Um, have, are men beginning, not beginning, but are men multiplying right now on the face of the earth? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, there's more people right now than probably maybe before the flood, what we're reading here. Uh, there's a lot of people here on the earth. I think it's 7 billion something now inhabitants here on earth. Verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Uh, the sons of God in the Old Testament is 100% of the time a reference to angels. You can read about that in the book of Job. Um, a lot of people try to twist that and confuse that, but that's what the Bible teaches. And if you believe something else, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Just as simple as that. Am I going to break fellowship with somebody over that issue? No, I'm not. But the abomination that's happening there is it's angels angelic beings uh, procreating with with women mortal women and they create you know giants and um you say well that's that's a really perverse thing there would be women that would be lined up for it today okay there's already movies I, I did a study years ago about angels what are they it's an audio sermon um and i played some audio clips from this uh city of angels i think it was called meg ryan and uh, nicholas cage movie years and years ago and it was about he was an angel and he had to give up his um eternal you know angelic state to come and fornicate with this woman it was a beautiful love story you know yeah mm -hmm. um it's gonna be happening if you know i think it's already happening but uh you know openly it'll be happening in the future I'll tell you the reason why in a little bit here but look at verse three okay this verse 3 is something the Lord put in my mind as a, you know, thought about what's going on today in the world. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Men before the flood were living to be almost a thousand years old. And the Lord's saying, I'm going to shorten your life. Wow. And you say, well, it says there that he, his spirit doesn't always strive with man, or is, is, is not going to strive with man much longer here and, and things. Um, that means God's upset and whatever. Well, yeah, it, it does mean that he's upset. We'll see that as we continue. But here's the point. When a nation becomes heathen, when people have no use for God, it's not because they're just, you know, uh, totally rejecting everything the Lord's doing. And stuff. I mean, that's there. But the whole point is, God literally turns his back on those people. When a nation becomes heathen, the Lord just says, my spirit's not going to strive with you anymore. And you know what? You look at the history of America. America's never been a Christian nation. Let's just get that out right away. I mean, America's been loaded with Freemasons and Catholic infiltrators, Jesuits, all kinds of stuff back on back through. But the Spirit of God strove with people in this nation. Um, you go back 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, people had moral character that they don't have today. Even 20 years ago, um, it's just not there. Uh, and it's getting worse as time goes by. We'll be talking about some of that as we go through the study here, but it's shocking to actually see it. Uh, what's going on? Um, God's Spirit is not striving with people anymore. Their conscience, the Bible talks about their conscience bears witness. God's written His law in their heart. But God gets to a point where He says that, that nation's wicked. That nation is evil. 
just like back here in Genesis chapter 6, those people, this world that I've created, man that I've created, they're wicked, they are evil, and my spirit's not going to strive with them anymore. You see, the natural state of a Christian is your spirit is striving with your flesh. Galatians chapter 5 says it's a war. And you'll understand that as a Christian. You'll understand that war that's always there where you're always there's that striving that goes on. A lot of strife between the flesh and the spirit. And lost people, a lot of times in the past, they had that. They understood that there were some things that were wrong. You just, hey, you just don't do that. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be wearing that. But it gets so bad when God just simply pulls back his hand from a nation and says, I'm done with that nation. And that nation becomes heathen. And now you don't see that restraint there of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit's telling people, don't do that, that's evil. Don't do that. Don't destroy yourself. And now you start to see people destroying themselves, literally. Let's continue. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, after the flood, still goes on. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Oh, did you ever hear the, the legend of Hercules? Yes, I have. A god uh, comes and, and procreates with a, with a woman, a mortal woman, and they produce a magnificent man. This Hercules, this great, powerful man, he's done all these great things. Yeah, and I believe that that was a angelic, and a bugs are really exciting this time of year, so excuse me while I'm killing bugs and on my arms and stuff. But <laughs> um, I think a lot of these ancient myths were exactly that. The stories of, you know, they might not have been actually named Hercules or whatever, you know, it might not have been a guy named that, but the point is there were, there were legends that were made about these men, these offspring, these giants. And you read about them in the Bible. Goliath is the most famous one. David sl slaying Goliath, this giant named Goliath. All right. I mean, oh, it's it's just a big person, just some just some uh, guy that just had the genes just kind of worked out right with the parents and whatever else, and he became a giant. Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. It's a cross between supernatural and mortal. Verse five. What did God think about all this? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know what you have when you have a heathen nation? Every imagination of the thoughts of their heart is only evil continually. They one-up each other. Oh, you did that wicked thing? I'm going to do that, but even sicker, even worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you know it's becoming a heathen nation. You know, back when I was a young man, occasionally you'd see a guy that was in the military or some other, you know, tougher guy, a uh, construction worker or whatever else, and he'd have a tattoo. You know, he'd have, um, you know, a little heart up here or something like that, and it'd say, you know, Mary or something, you know, on there, you know, his wife's name, girlfriend's name, whatever else. And uh, that was about it. You know, you might see an occasional one here, one on the forearm somewhere, but it was rare, you know. And uh, nowadays, the tattoo thing is just insanity. I mean, I, I, am, I am mortified, <laughs> literally mortified, it's, it's just shocked at how people, there's just no discernment. And half of them are professing, I shouldn't say half, but a lot of them are professing Christians. You know, I did a video years ago about James White, Dr. James White, defender of the new, these new versions and things and attacks the King James Bible. And the guy gets a big old tattoo on his arm. And I think, okay, you know, and, I, and I've talked to these modern Christians and they got tattoos and things. Oh, I'm, I'm witnessing with my tattoos. What's going on? America is becoming a heathen nation. And so are the other countries as well. A lot of them have already crossed over into being heathen nations. But my point is, it's just, it's wickedness. I at the store the other day, I guess yesterday actually, and there's this girl and her whole arm is red and blue stars. Why? Why? Because God's Spirit no longer strives. God's Spirit no longer says, don't do that, stop. Hey, that's wicked, don't, don't do that. I mean, think about this. 
I have some kind of a printer and I'm out there in public and I got this big printer in the back of my van or something like this and I come along and I say, hey, excuse me, I need, I need, I'll pay somebody $100 to help me load the ink cartridges into this thing. And they say, oh, you know, I'd like to make $100. And I say, yeah, uh, okay, here's the ink cartridge. And I hand it to them and I say, just don't let the ink spill on your skin because if you do, it can't, it, it never comes off. It's there permanently. How many people do you think would take me up on my offer for $100 to help with that? They'd say, well, do you have any gloves or something? I don't want to get ink on me that's going to be there permanently. That doesn't wash off. And yet that's exactly what a tattoo is. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, let me ask you something. I'm going to go off a little, little rant here on the tattoo thing, so just bear with me. Let me ask you something. How many people that get tattoos are even considering what it's going to be like when they're 80 years old? They don't. Tattoos are all about just, just carving in my flesh and putting ink in there and, and things. Somebody going through depression, somebody going through some kind of a, a, a bad situation, whatever else, and they just just get drunk and go to some tattoo parlor and give me that one there on the wall. Put it right there. Put it wherever. Nobody, nobody goes into a tattoo parlor and says, give me something that's going to look good on me when I'm 80 years old. Nobody's going to do that. What's going on? God's spirit is not striving with people anymore. And the tattoo thing is leading up to the ultimate tattoo, and that's going to be the mark that is upon the forehead in Revelation chapter 20. I do believe it's an implantable microchip as well in the hand or in the forehead, Revelation 13. But Revelation 20 says upon. They're going to have a tattoo right upon their forehead. It's leading up to it. Why? Um, because God's given up on America and on most of the other countries. There's a few people that are going to get saved yet and then the body of Christ leaves and then everything just kicks off and it's going to be terrible. Absolutely horrible. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, there's still some Christians out there that find grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's still a few people out there that are still saying, hey, I want to live righteously. I want God's holiness in my life. I don't want to live like the lost world and look like the lost world. That stuff vexes my righteous soul. I see people walking around, you know, and, and, and just tattoos and using the F word and just, and, you know, they smell like a, a, a you know, like they just came out of a barn fire or something, you know, cigarette smoke, in other words. And it just, you know, shopping cart has got cases of beer and things. And, and you just think to yourself, my word. Crazy. You say, well, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. That's way back in the Old Testament. Okay, turn to Matthew chapter 24. If you don't, always, if you don't already know where I'm going with this. Matthew chapter 24. We'll begin in verse 36. This whole thing is about the second coming of Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble. The Lord is speaking to Jews. He's not speaking to Christians. There are no Christians yet. He hasn't died on the cross. Okay, don't fall for the non-dispensational lie there. Um, but he's speaking to his Jewish disciples, and, and you know he's talking about them in Judea. You know, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Christians don't keep the Sabbath day. Read Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Okay, I've done plenty of studies on Matthew chapter 24. But look at verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Speaking about his second coming, not the rapture, not the catching up of the body of Christ. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, the days of Noe. What it's talking about there is the days of Noah. Noe is your Greek word coming into English. Noah is your Hebrew word coming into English. Okay, so it's, it's talking about the same one. How do you know? Keep reading. Verse 38, for as, in, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So you know it's talking about Noah 
and you know because it mentions the ark and it mentions the flood. So Noe is your New Testament word, same you know as Noah in the Old Testament. Just get that in there. But uh, you see something that's that's key there. The end times are characterized by a return to pre-flood conditions, the way it was before the flood in the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6. And what do we have? God's Spirit was not striving with, me, with man anymore because it actually repented God that He had made man. I mean, what do you think of, of God, uh, just how He feels when He sees one of His creation, one of the people that He made, just taking ink and just putting it in the skin and destroying their health with cigarettes and uh, destroying their health with drunkenness or drugs or, you know, all kinds of other things. How do you think the Lord feels about that? And uh, glorifying violence through violent video games, killing people for entertainment. Some of you Christians out there that play those kind of games. I used to do a lot of that stuff myself. The Lord convicted me, so you need to stop that stuff. But, uh, oh, you can, it's, just, it's just a game. It's, really? Do you think the Lord feels that way? Hmm. Uh, might want to think about some of that. Next, we're going to turn to um, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Got a mosquito here. It just keeps on getting my arm. John 16, beginning in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. Reprove the world of sin? Yeah. Yeah. And of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan's judged already. His, his doom is fixed. He's not going to get out of it. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Hmm. Very interesting. The Holy Spirit of God, what did we read back there in Genesis chapter 6? My spirit shall not always strive with man. We just read out of the mouth of Jesus Christ here. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit deals with lost people. Uh, you know one of the, the re big reasons why so many people have departed from this ministry? Because the Holy Spirit preaching or speaking through me when I preach and I'm reading scripture that a lot of preachers don't dare preach because it can cost their uh, tithe money and whatever else. And then, that, and then they have problems with paying their bills and whatever, the, the building and keeping it going. Yeah, but, you know, the Lord helps me to poke at some sin in your life. And the Holy Spirit gets in there and says, hey, what about that? That thing needs to go. And all of a sudden, then there goes from being a great preacher to now a cult leader in your sight. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And what you're actually doing is, I mean, I don't care what people think of me, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um... But the thing you need to be careful about is when you start to tell the Holy Spirit to shut up. When you uh, start to go against the Holy Spirit of God. When He's convicting you of sin and you start to say, nah, I don't want to hear about that. Don't warn me about that stuff. Don't, don't talk to me about that stuff. Uh, because there's going to come a point in time when the Holy Spirit just simply says, okay, my Spirit's no longer going to strive with you. You want to do that stuff over there? You want to do those wicked things? Broken record here. I've got to say it again. All sin is negative. I preach that and preach that and preach that. Some people still don't get it. All sin is negative. 
God's Holy Spirit should be there to convict you if you're saved and say, stop this wicked sinning. And you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. I understand that. I'm not saying you can be sinlessly perfect. I've never preached that. I preach against it. You know, yet still people lie about me. Old Denlinger says you can be sinlessly perfect. I've never preached that. But you see, when you have sin in your life and you just let it go and it gets worse and worse and worse, you destroy your life. You make a wreck of your life. And if you're lost, um, God's Spirit's not always going to strive with you. There comes a point in time when God says, okay, um, nationally, uh, things are pretty bad right now. And um, I about had it with that nation. And um, God pours out His judgment on a wicked nation. And God's judgment is coming very, very soon to this country. In many ways, it's already here. And we go over a whole big study on that. But the whole point of the matter is, um, I just see it more and more. You know, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of different signs of it, of just America becoming a heathen nation and self-destruction. I mean, you know, right now the economy, there's so many signs that the economy is in really, really bad shape. And yet people will turn on the television and they'll say, oh, it says that we're doing great. It's better than ever. And all this low unemployment and all this stuff like this. Never mind the fact that they don't count the people that are no longer on unemployment, that no longer are even looking for a job. That's not counted. You know, whole other thing there. But the economy is really bad. But yet what are people doing? Getting themselves into more and more and more debt. Just shoveling the debt in. Hey, I want that new vehicle. Hey, I want this new house. Hey, I want this new this and I want that new that and whatever else. They want to have all their fun now. Well, there's going to come a day when you're not going to be able to pay, make those payments if the economy crashes. The dollar tanks. We go to World War III. What are you going to do? Well, I'll worry about it when that time comes. The responsibilities and everything else and stuff, I'll just shove them out there into the future. See it all the time. Uh, why? Well, because God's Spirit's not always striving. It's not always going to strive with man. You understand? The Bible says, beware of covetousness. You know, people, lost people in the past had sense. They had common sense. They would say, you know what? Yeah, I don't really want to get into all kinds of debt here. This is not a good thing and whatever else. I mean, the first Great Depression, a lot of people lost everything. Even though they were a lot more frugal and a lot more intelligent with how they did things. Um, here we are going into the, you know, it was about the 1920s back then when the Depression happened. And here we are in the 2000s. 20s, almost 100 years later, and signs are a lot worse for the economy. They weren't 20 trillion something in debt back in 1920. We are today. I mean, it is bad. It is horrifying when you really understand the reality of what's coming. And I mean, you could go over just proof after proof after proof after proof. The, the automation of, of a lot of jobs out there and things like that. People are going to be losing their jobs. People losing, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Social security system is bankrupt. They're just, you know, people on social security today are basically just taking the money from those that are working and paying into the system. They don't have all the reserves. You know, the dollar's a joke. I mean, the gold and silver standard is being majorly manipulated. I mean, there's just so many different things when you study, when you do research, and you realize, oh, wow, this is really bad, isn't it? And there's going to be a really bad time coming in the future. Yeah, just like the Bible says. And, you know, you get these preachers, and they come out, and they say, uh, friends, I'm tell here to tell you today, you might think it's dark, you might think it's bad, but I am here to tell you, I believe we're headed for revival. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, America's not headed for a revival. Okay? Uh, not on your life. God's Spirit is not striving with man anymore. I saw a, a brother, um, Brother Jacob, put up a video of this Dr. Brown guy or whatever else. And this, this, whatever you want to call him. I'm not even going to use, you know, words I like to call him. Uh, this guy's coming out and he's saying that, uh, you know, we can have revival because see back in the 17th century, they had, they had it really bad. And a lot of the church leaders were saying it was really bad over there in England. And then they had the great awakening and they had the Methodists and all this other stuff. Uh, yeah. And they had one Bible, the King James Bible. Okay. Even though, 
you know, John Wesley of the Methodists was trying to mess with it and come out with his own version. <laughs> Another issue, and the Methodists have done some really evil things. Uh, I'll be doing more stuff on that in the future. But um, what was going on back there in the, the mid-17th century is nothing compared to today. All right? Uh, to say, well, the, the, if they could have revival back then, then we can have it today. Uh, you're crazy. You're crazy in the head. All right? Uh, well, of course, he's not really, I shouldn't really call him crazy. It's more just about money. You know, he doesn't want to lose that income. Very typical. Hebrews chapter 3. The book of Hebrews. And this book is written to Hebrews. Okay? I know that's really difficult for some people to get, especially if you're non-dispensational. Of course, you don't understand a lot if you're non-dispensational, but... Oh well. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Uh, speaking to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, if you depart from the living God, if, if we believe not, yet he abideth, or yet he is, let me turn there. Sorry, my mind is, I didn't have this in my notes. By the faithful, he cannot deny himself. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um... I want to make sure I get it quoted correctly. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So if you have an evil heart of unbelief, uh, well, you're out of fellowship with the Lord, but you're not going to lose your salvation. Okay, today, in the time of Jacob's trouble, the book of Hebrews, oh yeah, you got a problem. Because if you, if you uh, get away from the Lord then, you're going to be taking the mark of the beast and worshiping the beast. And his image. So that you can buy yourself. Verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. All sin is negative. Sin is deceitful. It draws you in and you think, oh, it's, it's not so bad. Hey, I didn't die from doing this. A little bit doesn't hurt. I know when to quit. You know, the, all the little sayings that people come up with. It's deceitful. Destroys you. And by the way, I'd like to just say another thing on tattoos. Let me just, you know, kick that thing again. Um, what do you think that, that ink's doing to your health? I mean, they're, they're carving it into your skin. It's a cutting in your flesh. Huh. So they're cutting your flesh and they're putting, they're injecting ink into your flesh. I don't think that's really all that good to have get entering into your bloodstream. Okay? Um, your, your skin is an organ. I think it's like the biggest organ in, on, you know, that your body has. You put chemicals and toxins on your skin, it's going to go into your blood. A lot of times I've seen videos where they're doing these tattoos and the guy's got a little towel or whatever and he's mopping up the blood where he's going a little bit deep with his needle. And uh, ink that never washes off getting into your bloodstream is healthy for you. Deceitfulness of sin. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You under the time of Jacob's trouble, that's going to be for you. You know, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says, you know, that uh, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. You got to endure, endure to the end. You have to hold your, stead, hold your confidence steadfast unto the end. Verse 15. While it is said, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Talking about the Jews there in the Old Testament. You can read about that in verse 16. Harden not your hearts. Deceitfulness of sin. God's spirit doesn't always strive with man. There comes a point in time when God looks at a nation and right now at the world and just simply says, I'm not going to strive with you anymore. The spirit of truth is not going to come into your life and say, hey, that's sinful. Hey, that's wicked. Judgment's coming. Verse 16. 
Um, I think one of the most frustrating things right now as a Christian, as a Bible believer, is understanding uh, how little people care about the truth. Um, it, you know, I saw Brother Philip had a video on that, and it just the thing of, of, you know, yeah, struggling with sin as a Christian, yeah, that's rough, and and uh, you know, having people casting out your name as evil, and you know, whatever else, yeah, that's that can be rough too. But but I'll tell you what, just understanding what's going on, understanding what the Bible says is coming, understanding all these things, and yet you you just people don't care. They don't care. Uh, it is a weird thing. I mean, you know, we're literally walking down the streets right now, brethren, with people that are going to be recipients of the mark of the beast. Literally. I mean, you're looking, you're looking into the eyes of people when you go out shopping that will be taking the mark of the beast in a few years. How long? I don't know. I have no idea how much longer we're going to have to, to you know, go through this. Uh, I don't know. Looking forward to leaving. Looking forward to hearing my name and come up hither. And I say, goodbye, world. See ya. <laughs> um, really looking forward to that. But uh, until then, you know, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say with this whole thing is don't be discouraged if you feel sometimes like I just can't get anywhere with anybody. Um, it is their fault. I understand that. Uh, it is all on them. But... You have to look at the scriptures and you have to realize that this end times here, God's spirit is withdrawing. He's not going to strive with men anymore. They want to be wicked. They want to do these things and, and live this evil way and, and whatever else. And it goes for generations and the Lord just simply says, okay, I'm not going to warn you anymore. I mean, the saying I heard many years ago, and that is the worst thing that God can do to a person is let them have their way. Just get to a point where he says, go ahead, turn them over to a reprobate mind. You want to do that stuff? You want to celebrate your mental illness uh, with all the different things that people do nowadays that just years ago would have been considered mentally ill? And now it's celebrated. Now it's a normal. It's the new normal. And um, God's spirit is not striving with men anymore. Um, so what should we do? <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll just say it this way. You know, there's, there's talk, different people talk out there about an EMP attack, you know, whatever else, electromagnetic pulse, go off above the atmosphere and it basically would fry all the electronics. Um, and all of a sudden life would change. And you'd go from your normal daily routine to just, Come out here somewhere and see what you can eat. Um, the grocery stores are gone. There are no more grocery stores. They don't work. I mean, the building's there, but there's no electricity. All the food goes bad. A couple days it's been clean, you know, picked clean by people rioting and looting. Um, there's no fuel for your car. Pumps don't work. The car doesn't work. Not even be able to drive it unless it's a older car with, you know, before electronic ignition points and stuff like that but you know whatever um, in other words it would be you're living a certain way and things change and now life just becomes about survival well I think in a spiritual sense it's getting to that point where you need to go out and you, you need to witness to people and things like that but you know it used to be you know you'd, you'd see somebody that's a sinner and they got to clean up this, this, and that, whatever else, and okay, they'd be fine. Now it's just that people are just destroying themselves. And, you know, I, I still believe a sinner can get saved no matter what they've done, certainly. But, my word, it's so hard now. And there's so many, so many different people coming out just lying about the Bible and just lying about the gospel and, and just some of the stuff these atheists come up with. You just scratch your head and you think, my word, where do you come up with this stuff? You know, God's Spirit's not striving with them anymore, you see. Every thought of their heart is only evil continually. Hey, I don't, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Uh, don't, don't cram your religious beliefs down my throat. Hey, I don't, I don't you, you know, your goody two-shoes kind of a thing here. I'm not really interested in that. And uh, mm -hmm. um, 
I think it could get to a point, brethren, before the catching up, where none of us are online anymore. Uh, we've all been kicked off the Internet, and uh, there's certain rules that you have to abide by and whatever else to be on, and you can't go with them as a... You can't submit yourself to them, I'll say it that way, as a Bible-believing Christian. And nobody wants to hear the gospel anymore. They all think you're crazy. Um, truth be told, some of them are even trying to get you put in prison. And, um, you know, I mean, what was it like for Noah? <laughs> I mean, think about that. What was it like for Noah before the flood started? Do you think he had much good fellowship? Uh, what do you think his neighbors thought about him? Oh, oh, hey, hey, Noah, you know, I, I've i been thinking about this. Thing. No, they were all laughing at him, mocking him, probably threatening him. Hmm. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, he wasn't part of the body of Christ. Spiritually, he was not connected to God. You and I are as Christians. Um, things are pretty crazy. And... Uh, Thankfully, you know, Noah, he had to go through the flood. God saved him. You know, he didn't have to be affected by the flood in terms of, um, you know, having to swim for a while or something like that. No, God preserved him. He went through that time. Um, as Christians, we're going to be called out before the time of Jacob's trouble even gets started. And again, I, you know, I'm seeing so many people that were once what would be called pre-trib, and now they're departing from that. And they're saying, well, actually, I think we'll be here for the Antichrist. And, well, I think we're going to be halfway through. And, well, you know, and, and I think to myself, can you just read plain English? The 24 elders are in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. The 24 elders are Christians. I've talked about that before. Proved that in other studies. Okay? It's just, it's crazy. And then there's a great number of angels that's, you know, around the, the throne. You know, late, I think it's less than 200 million or something. And they're there in the resurrection, whereas the angels of God in heaven, Jesus spoke about that. It's there. They're there before the Antichrist is unleashed. And he's unleashed by Jesus Christ. Now you get a lot of these new IFB people and they're saying, Jesus doesn't do anything. It's all the devil opening the seals and, or doing the seals and whatever else. And Jesus is just kind of opening the seals so he can see what's going on. And he's not in control of the whole thing. It's it just, it's insanity. And again, the saved... There's a bigger and bigger divide all the time now for the saved from the lost. Why? Because God's Spirit's not there to strive anymore. So it's getting harder for lost people to pretend that they're Christians. Because the Holy Spirit of God is withdrawing and saying, Okay, I'm not going to convict you about those sins anymore. And now it's just a free-for-all with the wicked sins that people are doing. So, um, you know... I think it's important to just go out there and try to witness, you know, pray about it. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe in the thing of the, the whole hyper soul winning movement type of Jack Hiles, go knock doors, you know, whatever else. I think that's one of the most ineffective ways of actually seeing people get genuinely born again. Um, I used to do it. I thought I was a great Christian for doing so, and I would brag about it, you know, and going out knocking doors and all this other stuff. And... Uh, that stuff's nonsense, to be quite frank with you. Um, I never saw anybody actually get born again the entire time. I saw fake professions of faith, and then they'd never show up at the church I was going to, or they would this, or that. You know, you see other things, and it's just fake, you know. And uh, But you get those numbers that you can report to make yourself look like a good Christian. You know, and then you can go around saying, when's the last time you won anybody to the Lord? And when's I have personally led, you know, Mm -hmm. Where's that at in Scripture? Where's anybody doing that in Scripture? Where's that question ever asked to anybody? When's the last time you personally led someone to Jesus Christ? It's never asked in Scripture. Nobody ever says that as a means of proving how holy you are. But, side issue. But, you know, the whole point I'm trying to make here is um, God's Spirit is not striving with man like He once was. And you're seeing these changes happening and yes, it's because man out of his own free will is getting worse, but it's also because God's Spirit is drawing back. And God is simply saying, okay, I've had enough of this wickedness in this nation. And His Spirit is now starting to pull back and say, all right, you people want your evil, 
you want all this wickedness out there? Okay, I'm going to let you have it. And so, as a Christian, you go out there, you say, Okay, Lord, help me to live a holy and righteous life. Help me to be that, that one that finds grace in your sight, Lord. I want to be the Noah of the 21st century. I want you to be able to say, Hey, it repents me that I've made man on the earth, but Brian found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But whoever out there, brother, sister, whoever you are, um, found grace in the eyes of the Lord because you're not going along with the things out there, the, the deceitfulness of sin. You're saying, no, nah, I don't want that. You know? Um, and I, I believe firmly, I mean, every time we go out, I say, okay, Lord, uh, help us to run into somebody today. Give us a divine appointment according to thy will, Lord. And uh, help us to be able to get there and, and witness to somebody or place a gospel tract or give someone the right person a gospel tract or whatever, Lord. You set it up. And so I, that's my advice to you. Uh, don't get down on yourself because you're not seeing you know, all kinds of people making professions of faith and whatever else. Uh, God's Spirit is not striving with this nation. I just, I can't, I can't, you know, think about that enough. It's just seeing the way things are going and, and just seeing, you know, how wicked people are becoming and just destroying their bodies. I, I just, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I can't believe, I can't even imagine what it'd be like to be in a big city or something like that. You know, I, I just, so just wanted to encourage the brethren out there um, just to stand strong. Um, keep, your, keep your life in check. Don't ever give up your King James Bible. Read it. Pray. Ask the Lord to, to answer your prayers and things. And uh, ask Him, you know, just, Lord, you give me opportunities. Help me to be that little light that's shining as this world gets darker and darker. And uh, pr protect us. Um, there's some bad stuff that could happen in this country before we go home to be with the Lord. And uh, it would be bad to go through. Just be frank about it. It would be real bad to go through some economic collapse or war on the streets or whatever else. There'd be some real bad times that could come. And just say, Lord, please, help us. So, that is going to be it. Just a quick little message here. And uh, just... Something the Lord's really been putting on my heart lately um, about this nation and about uh, all the other nations, too. I realize that. It's not just America. Um, so, hope that's an encouragement to you. And uh, we'll see. And I'm going to be doing an update video here and, and after this one. And so, let people know what's going on. And uh, we'll see you in future videos. Stand by your King James Bible, brethren. Don't ever let go of this book.